Hi, Martin Turner here. In this video, we begin to introduce the financial statements to you by looking at the balance sheet and the income statement. We then look at the extended accounting equation and see that all the five elements of accounting are included in the balance sheet and income statement. Let's start by looking briefly at last week's class. Hi, Martin Turner here, and welcome to the week three lecture for Act 11059, Accounting, Learning and Online Communication. And today we start our few weeks on introducing financial statements. This is like me introducing you to some good friends. And so it's great fun to, to help you to start to become a bit more familiar with the financial statements. In last week's class, um, what was the most important thing you learned today? Well, to keep up with the weekly work and be on top of the assessments, otherwise you'll fall behind. So some people got the idea that in this unit, um, that one of the keys to success is just to work steadily each week. If you get behind, a few people are behind because you're starting late for all sorts of reasons. Um, so you've got to catch up, but once you're caught up, and a lot of people uh, are caught up, keep up with the weekly work each week and stay, keep on top of the assessments. The assessments are assessed learning tasks. They're the learning tasks. We happen to be assessing them as we go along. And, uh, and then it, it's all fine if you keep up. I learned more about the entity concept and that I need to think in order to learn. So quite a few people were talking about the entity concept. Um, and we'll just review that in a minute. Um, at one of the, arguably the one good idea that accounting has had and a key concept for us to be very clear on in accounting. And other people comment, and people also commenting that they need to think in order to learn, need to make sure that we're, le we're understanding what we're learning, not just skimming over the top and rote learning without really thinking about it, understanding it. And uh, a number of people have reflected over the last couple of weeks that maybe that they didn't learn so well at school in many ways or in other formal environments. They kind of can't remember things too much. And, uh, and they might have been doing a lot of this rote learning without also understanding it. Nothing wrong with rote learning. We have to remember things, but we need to do more if that's all we do. And so we need to think, we need to be active in our learning. And, uh, and you'll get some practice of doing that in this unit and of course, across your whole degree. Assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. This is something you need to remember. You can just write it out 40 times and you'll remember it. With occasional repetitions, you'll remember it for life. This is the business model on which accounting is based. This is the view of business that accounting has. Just five elements, that's all. It's a simplification of what business is. Assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. Active learning is key. So quite a lot of people have been reflecting on that in these first few weeks. The entity concept is a powerful concept because it frames the way we view business. So a number of people have been thinking about why is the entity concept such a powerful concept? Isn't it sort of obvious? As we view the firm different, as separate to the owners, but it wasn't obvious in the past. Often people just mixed it all up. And it's powerful because it, this is how we view business. This is basically how everyone will view business already when they come. It's been that influential. We view businesses as separate to the owners. We'll be looking at some of the implications of that. Only companies that produce general purpose financial reports need to follow GAP or all the rules of accounting in Australia. So a number of people, this is the idea of a reporting entity. It's only those businesses, some people are thinking about this, and it's a very important point. Some of the business, some businesses produce reports, they give out financial reports, they give out to the general public or fairly widely. All of our companies are like that. They're listed companies. You can get their annual reports and their financial statements on the internet. But any firm that sends out its reports to a reasonably broad group of people, it needs to follow all these rules. If you don't, you don't need to follow them. But people can tend to follow some of them anyway. A 
And what questions remain unanswered? Well, quite a few people are saying, I'm still getting my head around accrual accounting. So we'll just review that in a minute. This is a very important concept underlying accounting. It can just take a while for the penny to drop and to understand it. It's not just about memorizing the definition, and we'll be looking at that in a minute. Accrual accounting is the basis of accounting. We don't just record transactions when cash changes hands. It's, we, 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 it, it's a, accrual accounting is where we record transactions when the economic substance occurs. What to actually do for the assignment? So quite a few people are thinking about what do we have to do with assignment and, and talking with each other and getting clear on that. That's very important. And for those who are coming in a bit late because of all the problems with visas and entries from overseas, um, then, um, then uh, you know, you, you've got to get on top of what's actually you need to do for the assignment. More details about how to use our blogs in the assignment. So a number of people are wondering, well, do I have to use my blog or how do I do it, or post things up? With the blogs in our unit, you get a mark for setting it up. So everybody should have set up their blogs by now. If you haven't, you'll, um, you, you need to do it. Um, but after that, how you use your blog is up to you. Some people use it a lot more than others. It's designed in our unit to be a vehicle where you can share your draft work with others. So you can just say, look, while you're discussing your draft work with others, you can say, here's the link to my whatever, and that goes to your blog, and that's the page in your blog. It's a very convenient way of sharing draft work. Other people start to blog, you know, in terms of posting stuff about themselves, the experiences and that, which is also great. And many people are starting to interact with each other via blogs as well. Why is the entity concept powerful? It was answered in class, but I still don't understand. So understanding the entity concept, understanding accrual accounting. So we'll have a little bit of a look at those. Now, this is important, accrual accounting. That that's, means we record transactions and economic events when their economic substance occurs. That's when we put them into the accounts. And this may be different. It quite often is in business to when cash changes hands. And we use the example of me catching the bus. I put, give the $50 to the bus driver. He puts it onto my swipe card. And then I just swipe the card when I catch the bus each time, it's sort of $5 a trip. And, um, and so I give the cash, but the economic, that's not revenue to the business because I haven't got any bus trips yet. It hasn't sold me anything, it's just taken the money. But it's only when I swipe the card each time I catch the bus that, I, um, that they would record the, the um, $5 of revenue. So the cash can occur at a different time to when they earn the revenue and also a different and also expenses the same. So you need to reflect on that in the now and in the coming weeks until you've really got a grip on that because that underpins accounting. And a lot of people when starting to study accounting or a lot of people who know nothing about accounting just assume it's when cash changes hands. But that's not how um, we record transactions. It, if the economic substance occurs at the same times of cash, yes, but quite often that's not the case. And the key point with this is it requires judgments about when the economic substance occurs. Cash is very clear cut. If you pay the cash, receive the cash, everybody can tell that the cash has changed hands. But in terms of economic substance, it requires judgments and different people can make different judgments. And that's quite, and that's fine, it's quite legal, but it, it's so it's that their judgments are involved and you need to be able to um, make those judgments well as an account. The entity concept, what's the entity concept? It's an awareness that of the owner or the proprietor, the owner of a business is who is separate and distinct from the business itself. The owner mm -hmm. is separate to the business. The blacksmith in a town and the blacksmith business are two separate things. And this is not just with companies, like we've got companies, they're separate legal entities to the owners. It's also for businesses in accounting. 
every business is seen as separate to its owners, even if it's a sole trader or a partnership, which don't have any separate legal entity. They're not separate legal entities to the owners. But in, but in accounting, it's seen as separate. And so the separation of accounting records of a business from the records of the business owners, they're kept completely separate. And the entity concept has an important implication for accounting. It means that's why we do double entry accounting, because we view the business as separate to the owners. That's why we put in everything twice. Why is that? Because every transaction of a firm has a dual aspect. Just as a coin has two sides, heads and tails, or there are two sides to a piece of paper, or usually two sides to any argument. In accounting, every transaction has two aspects because it affects itself, the firm itself, and the owners, everything a firm does. That's the entity concept of cruel accounting and double entry accounting. There's some of the things people were discussing and thinking about uh, last week. Now, in this week, our agenda is we're going to have a look at the balance sheet and the income statement, and then we'll do the minute paper. So I'm going to introduce you to these two friends of mine. Balance sheet. This is the financial position of our firm on one day. That's right, just one day. For Ryman Healthcare, it's the 31st of March. For your firm, it might be the 30th of June. It can be any, any day. It's the financial position on one day. And the balance sheet shows the assets, liabilities, and equity of our firm on one day. And there's no required format or standard terms. So they can, you'll find the, the, the balance sheet can be called the statement of financial position. It can be called a number of different things. And also you'll find that different firms will have some variations in the way they format it. In quite a few terms in the balance sheet, you know, the same type of item can have different names in, in different, different firms' balance sheets or the same name can refer to a couple of different things. So there's no standard terms or required formats, although you'll see some patterns when you um, look at each other's accounts. So the balance sheet is the, is the equity and assets and liabilities of a firm. And it's usually on one page. Most balance sheets are one page. But when you look at your items, you'll see a lot of footnotes and, and they connect little numbers next to various items and they connect back to a whole lot of information that can go on for pages and pages. And the group, all of our firms are group or consolidated accounts. Every listed company I've ever come across is more than one company. So there's the parent company, that's the company we buy shares in if we're buying into a listed company. But that parent company will typically own or control other companies. So the balance sheet we're looking at is not just the balance sheet of the parent company, like Roman Healthcare, but it includes also the accounts of all its subsidiaries. Every company, so Roman Healthcare has various subsidiaries, all of those companies will keep their own accounts. They're separate legal entities, they keep accounts. But in the, in the balance sheets that we'll be looking at, it'll be all those different um, companies that form the group will be, all those items will be put together into the one financial statements. So here's the balance sheet for Ryman Healthcare. So let's have a look at this one. Now Ryman Healthcare's balance sheet is called consolidated balance sheet as at or at the 31 March 2021. This is its last balance sheet. We haven't got the 31 March 2022 balance sheet because we haven't got there yet. And it's called the consolidated balance sheet, Roman Health Kids one. So consolidated, that means it's not just the parent company, it's all the subsidiary companies as well. Every item, item by item, they're all added together. And you can see how the balance sheet is at one day. And for Roman Health Kids, case it's the 31 March 2021. So all the items in the balance sheet are at that one day, just one day. And you can see that um, it shows the 2021 figures for all these items, assets, equity and liabilities. And it also shows the previous year, 2020. 
So you see your firm will do the same. It shows this year and the second year. We said there are no standard formats, but there are a few requirements about how things are presented. And one of them is that you show the previous year. And so you'll see our firms all do that. And then there's assets, equity and liabilities. So you can see here's all the assets, total assets. Here's all the equity items, total equity. And here's all the liabilities, total liabilities. And they add up the total equity and liabilities. And the total assets, 9,171,609,000 is the same as the total equity and liabilities. So the way this is presented, equity plus liabilities equals assets. Now the numbers are shown in thousands of dollars. This is a New Zealand company, so they're New Zealand dollars, but a thousand dollars. And so you can see the first item, cash and cash equivalent, is 20 million. 171,000, because it's all in thousand dollars. So you can see on that particular day, 31 March, Ryman Healthcare had $20 million. And the year before, on the same day, it had 34 million. Cash and cash equivalents. Trade and other receivables, $542 million. $542,798,000 had nearly half a billion dollars of trade and other receivables. Inventory, 26 million. Had no inventory the year before. Advances to employees, these are, these are where the company lends money to employees, 11 million. This is to help fund them to purchase shares in the company. Property, plant and equipment, 1 billion, 658, that million, 583,000, that's, <laughs> over $1.6 billion of property, plant, and equipment. Investment property, six billion, six billion, eight hundred and thirty-seven million seventy-eight thousand. 78,000. These are their retirement villages. Intangible assets, 42 million. Deferred tax asset, 32 million, to total 9,171. And you see how there are all these notes, little numbers here next to each item. We see we have property, plant and equipment, note six. If we wanted to find out more about that item, we can scroll through to note six and find out more about property, plant and equipment. So let's do that. So there's footnote six, property, plant and equipment. And so it's got all this extra information here. So here's 2021 figures, and there's it's 1.6 billion that was in the balance sheet. And here's all sorts of detail, and you can see it shows you the balance a year ago, 1.4 billion that would be in the balance sheet for the previous year. Then all these different changes and appreciation and other items, and they're under various columns for different types of plant and equipment. Property, plant and equipment, you can see you've got land, buildings, properties under development, plant and equipment, furniture and fittings, motor vehicles, and some leasehold assets, right of use assets. So that's a whole heap of detail there. And then it keeps going on. It shows the previous year, 2020, and a whole lot of detail. And then, I'm just doing this. And then it's got a whole lot of words. It tells you what the property plant equipment is. All completed rest homes and hospitals are included within the definition of freehold land and buildings. So within here, um, all their rest homes or like nursing homes, uh, all their aged care facilities. We've also got some hospital care for very high care people. That's all in here. And they were revalued to fair value based on independent valuation report prepared by registered valuers, CBRE limited at the 31st of March, 2021 in line with this accounting standard fair value measurement. These revaluations are undertaken every two years unless there is sustained market evidence that's significant change in fair value. So there's a whole lot of discussion about, they are giving you some background information about how they value um, their their freehold land and buildings. You see how they say that valuation? 
So all of these items, they total 328 million of land and 381 million of buildings. That's their rest homes and hospitals. And they'd say how they revalue them. All the others are held at cost, you see. Those items there at cost, at cost. And then they give you the valuation techniques and a whole lot of stuff. And it keeps going on and on. And it goes to three pages. And I think that's all. But I have a look. No, there's more. <laughs> three and a half pages. Talked about the leasehold assets. So there we go. We have three and a half pages on property plot. Or two and a half pages. Eh? Yeah, here's the third one. Yeah, three and a half pages of property plant and equipment. That's one item in the balance sheet. So the balance sheet is just one page. But so that item there is the balance sheet itself is just one page. But just for one item there, the footnote gives us three and a half pages of information. And so on. For all of this, we can find out all sorts of information by going to the footnote. So we don't just read the footnotes in one go. We have a look at the balance sheet. And then if we want to find something more, we can go to the footnote. So you'll find that as you are doing your assignments. So that's the balance sheet of my company. You can have a look at your own firm's balance sheet for Ryman Healthcare. Now, the income statement, the balance sheet tells you assets, liabilities, and equity and on a single day. Now, the income statement shows us changes over a period. So it's not just one day, it's changes over a period, it's usually one year. And the income statement has the revenue and expenses. So the income statement shows revenue, less expenses, which equals income or profit. The income is the bottom line of the income statement. And the source of the saying, well, what's the bottom line? You know, what's the take out of the bottom? Well, the income statement, its bottom line is the profit or income figure. Revenue, less expenses. Again, the income statement has a lot of footnotes, just like the balance sheet. There's no required format or standard terms. So different companies can have um, different formats and uh, different uh, words can mean different things, in different company statements. And the income statement is also a group or consolidated accounts. It shows you the income statements of all, of not just the parent, but of all the um, companies in the group. So our income statement here, Ryman Healthcare, it has two. Many of you will have two. So it has a consolidated income statement, which is here. And then it also has a consolidated statement of comprehensive income. So your firm might have two, or it might combine these two into one. And so you might have a consolidated statement of comprehensive income that includes everything, or it could be called a number of different things. So Raman Healthcare, it has a consolidated income statement. And you see it's for a period, for the year ended 31 March, 2021. So that's for a period, in this case, a year. Year ended 31 March 2021. That's the same for the consolidated state for comprehensive income. That's it. Now, in the income statement, it has various items of revenue. And then it has various expenses. And then it has the profit. So what are Ryman Healthcare's revenue? Well, care fees. They're the fees it earns in its aged care centre. $359 million. A lot of that comes from the government. Management fees, $93 million. These are the fees it charges the residents in its retirement villages to manage the retirement villages. 
Interest received, 100,000. Has a bit of cash and earns a little bit of interest on it. Other income, 3,280. Total revenue, $455 million. Now, it also has an extra item, fair value movement of investment properties, 416 million for a total income of 872 million. So it's got the revenue. Your firm may have some items like that. It may or may not. And that gives the total income. Then you have the operating expenses. The operating, the operating expenses, $395 million. These are negative numbers in here with brackets. The brackets around it mean that they're negative. So that's $395 million. That's more than a million dollars a day every day of the week, including weekends, including Christmas Day, a lot. More than a million dollars every day. Every day it's spending, like today, a million dollars. So that's a lot of expenses in Ryman Healthcare in, in operating all these retirement villages and it's building a lot of new retirement villages. So it's spending money in all sorts of ways. Depreciation and amortisation expense, 32 million. Finance costs, 19 million. So that's paying interest and so on on its borrowings. It's got quite a few borrowings. Loans, are loss on disposal, 15 million. That's for selling some assets at less than book value. And its total expenses are 462 million. So its total income here was 872 million. Total expenses, 462. So its profit before income tax, 410 million. 872 minus 462. Income tax credit to 12,561. So it didn't pay any tax. In fact, it got a tax credit, which means it can pay less tax in the future. Profit for the year, $423 million. So this profit for the year, and then all these figures for the year before, this profit for the year is the bottom line of the income statement. The income statement is the profit. Again, you see all these footnotes here. So you can, if you want to find out more about any of these items, you go to the footnote. So for example, with footnote one, there's a page there and it shows or some detail about the operating expenses. And so you can see employee costs are a big part of their expenses, $264 million out of the 395 are employee costs. So they've got all these employees working in these retirement villages. Property related expenses, 54 million, other operating expenses, 75, and they give some details down there. Total operating expenses, 395 million. And then it gives a few other bits of details. talks about some of the claims it made under COVID and what, what it gave back. So so that's the consolidated income statement of Ryman Healthcare. So you'll be putting all of that into your spreadsheet. Quite a few people have already put their company's income statement in the spreadsheet. And this ends the profit for the year. That's the bottom line here, 423 million profit for the year. Then we go to the consolidated statement of comprehensive income and there's the profit for the year at the top. So the bottom number there is the top number here. So when you're putting them all in, you put these two together into the one, into your income statement section. And so you get the profit for the year. So you've already got that in, you don't have to put it in twice. And then you just put in the rest of these items. These are the other, Comprehensive income. Revaluation of property, plant and equipment, 195 million. Fair value movement and reclassification of cash flow hedge reserve, 7 million and on and on. A lot of these items will have sort of labels that you, know, you, you don't understand. They just stuff. You might have a little bit of an idea of what they are and uh, they can have quite complicated names. So I've got all those items 
And the other comprehensive income totals um, $215 million. It's mainly the revaluation of property plant equipment. And then, and the total comprehensive income is the profit for the year plus the other comprehensive income, which gives you $638 million. So that together is Roman Healthcare's income statement, the consolidated income statement and the consolidated statement of comprehensive income. So that's the balance sheet in the income statement. I've shown you Roman Healthcare's and you'll be having plenty of chances to look at your own firms. Now we know that the extended accounting equation is assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. If you haven't memorized that, you've got to memorize it now. Just write it down lots of times, 40 times. And we saw that the balance sheet has assets, equity and liabilities. So it covers off those. And then we also saw that the revenue and expenses are in the income statement. So what that means is that all those five elements of accounting are in the balance sheet and the income statement. So the balance sheet and the income statement have all the five elements of accounting covered. So why do we have a couple more? We have the changes in equity, the statement of changes in equity. And what that tells us, it gives us further details about how equity has changed between the balance sheet, last year's balance sheet and this year's balance sheet, how equity has changed over a period, usually the last year. So we get a lot more detail on what's happening with equity. Remember, the balance sheet is just at one day. The change in equity, statement of change in equities gives us some more information about how that equity has changed during the period, how much related to profit, how much related to transactions with shareholders, dividends, share issues, and so forth. Why does, it have, why does equity have its own financial statement like that? Well, it's because the owners of a business are interested in the equity, are interested in the accounting for its interest in the firm. And so, and particularly the changes in that during a period. And the other financial statement we have is the statement of changes in, in cash flow. So it's the changes in cash. We weren't putting that into our financial statements, but the changes in cash why are we so interested in cash? It's one of the items in our balance sheet. Roman Healthcare had about 20 million of it. But it's got a lot of other assets, billions of other dollars in assets. Why are we so much interested in cash? Why does cash have its own statement, statement of, um, of cash flow? Well, the reason for that is that there's only one way a company can go broke, that it can fail, and that is to run out of cash. As long as you've got cash, you can keep going. It's just like us in our personal lives. As long as you can go to the ATM, get out some cash or swipe your card, I think, as long as you've got cash, you can keep going. But the moment you come somewhere where you haven't got any cash, you swipe the card and they say, sorry, you can't accept it. You've got no money, you've got no cash, you're in trouble. Same for a business. You've got no cash, you can't pay the staff, you can't pay its suppliers, it's in trouble. What happens when you... You might have some other assets, of course, but what happens? You've got staff and you can't pay them. The pay is supposed to go through that night. So you tell the staff, sorry, I haven't got any cash. And I can give you an office chair. How would you like an office chair <laughs> instead of your salary cash? What are the staff going to do? Well, they're going to they're have a riot. <laughs> going to go, what? I'm, office chair? They want the cash. And why do the staff want the cash? Why do your suppliers want cash rather than, say, an office chain? Because if you're a staff member, you're going to go to the supermarket and buy some food. What if you went to the supermarket and with an office chair? And you come in, you come to the checkout and say, oh, sorry, I haven't got any cash, but I've got this great office chair. <laughs> what are they going to say to you? <laughs> And the poor, the poor checkout operator is going to think, man, I've got a real Lulu here. You know? So cash 
is our means of exchange. So cash, so we want to keep track of cash. That's why it has its own financial statement. It's the only way a company can go broke. And you need, and, you, and the reason it's the only way you go broke is because as long as you've got cash, you can keep going. But the moment you don't have cash and you can have all sorts of other assets like office chairs, but it, you're going to go broke. You need the cash because of, that's the medium of exchange. All right, so I've introduced you to the balance sheet and the income statement. And we've also seen that there's the statement of changes in equity and the statement of cash flows. What was the, now go to Socrates and answer these two questions. I'll give you a minute. What was the most important thing you learned today? And what questions remain unanswered? Well, we've got May from Brisbane. The most important thing for May was the breakdown in an annual report into detail. Uh, what did you mean by that, May? And just uh, unmute your mic. What was? What did you mean by that, May? Break down an annual report into detail. So the annual report has the financial statements in it. So the financial statements is what we're looking at. So that's, I know what you're meaning, the balance sheet and income statement. And we broke it up and we had a little bit of a look at it and introduced it. I think that's what you're saying was the most important thing. Hester, we learned how to view an income statement. Yes, I'm just, I'm introducing you to my friends, the income statement. Krishal Vidara. Since I am late to the emissions, the most important thing I learned today is how to write KCQs. <laughs> You're looking up at that. You were, so you were working on that. That's great. The, the key concepts and questions, for those who are writing their step one still, there's quite a few, because we've had so many people coming late, there's quite a few people still writing step one, which is fine. Um, there are no late penalties for step one. It was due at the beginning of week two. But there are no late penalties on any step in assignment one, including step one, until the whole assignment is due on Monday, week five. So if you haven't done your step one, just get going on it now. Read those two chapters out of the study guide, introduction, chapter one. And uh, there's a little bit of guidance on how to write key concepts and questions in the assignment itself. There's also a short video. But don't sweat it too much. We mark step one generously. I understand it can be a new, quite a new thing for most people. Most of us are used to just summarising stuff, you know, at school or other formal education, but it doesn't really cut it in accounting. We don't want people just to summarise because you want to give advice to people. And you, so you read it and um, the key concepts and questions identify, say, two or three key concepts. You can have as many as you like. Um, and uh, just things that uh, strike you as interesting or confusing or, um, you know, jump out at you, and write those key concepts in your own words and, and then and describe what it meant, what you think it is. And then you can tell me whether you agree or disagree with it, you know, your response, whether it was confusing, surprising, interesting, and why and why <laughs> so you're giving your opinion about it but you're giving the reasons for your opinion see opinions are cheap we all have them about all sorts of things that we often don't know anything about much anyway so it's opinion but it's the reasons why i think this for these reasons so that'll be great crucial for you to get going on those kcqs and for all those who are still working on it Marichik, Marich, Marich, in Brisbane. The extended accounting equation and where the five elements were covered. That's a great insight. Marich. The extent, you need to know the extended accounting equation. If you don't know that, you don't understand anything much about accounting. We need to know the five elements, which is what Marich was mentioning. And we need to know how they're related to each other, which is the extended accounting equation. What's the extended accounting equation? Assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. And we saw that those five elements, the equity 
assets and liabilities are in the, in the balance sheet as at one day, and the revenue and expenses are in the income statement and they're over a period. Oh, Ashley, you've written out the fundamental accounting equation. That's very good. So there we are. So for quite a few people, the most important thing you learned today was that fundamental accounting equation. If you know that, then you understand, the, or you, at least you are aware of the business model underpinning accounting. Joseph, the difference between income statements and balance sheets and how to read understand them. Yeah, Joseph, you can be a little bit more, you can say a little bit more in these if you want to. But what I understand you're saying, the differences between the income statements and balance sheets, well, the income statements for a period, the balance sheets as at a certain day, the income statements, revenue and expenses, the balance sheets, assets, equity and liabilities, and we could go on with various differences. And there are some similarities. They both have footnotes connected to different items which you can refer to. The, um, um, the, uh, um, the, you know, they show the previous last year's numbers as well as this year's and so on. And then how to read and understand them. One of the things uh, that people get out initially is that you can just, the balance sheet or the income statement, they're typically just one page, but there's all that other information, the footnotes. You don't have to just read the footnotes through in one go. You only look at the footnotes as you want to get more information on a specific item that's in the financial statements. Derek, Nanda, cash is the main asset that is needed for a business or anything to function. <laughs> well, the importance of cash is that there's only one way to go bust. You go bust when you run out of cash. <laughs> that's why it has its own financial statement. It's also the medium of exchange. So that's why we go bust when we've got no cash because we've got, we can't exchange. Um, but that's the same as an individual. You can not be making any profits. You can be, you know, all sorts of things be happening in your business or in, in your own life. You might not be having any income. But as long as you've got cash, you're okay. You can keep going. Um, so the cash is an, it, it, is that, it, it, is, it, it is that special asset that we're interested in. That's why it has its own financial statement. Finish up. I got the clear view of accrual accounting that it may be different to when cash changes hands. Good on you, Vinisha. You, you need to keep reflecting on this. Everybody should keep reflecting on what accrual accounting is. So you've got a good grip on it by the end of the term. When we're looking at our financial statements, for example, the transactions that are all in there behind the scenes that are built up into those items, they're based on accrual accounting. So you might be getting all this revenue, but that doesn't mean you got the cash. Um, the cash could come at a different time. It could come earlier or it could come later. And there are judgments. So these accounts have quite a lot of judgments in them. So there's a certain degree of subjectivity here that, uh, that a lot of people who don't know anything about accounting think it's much more objective than it is. Imogen in Melbourne, how to look at a bank statement and how to break it down. I think, uh, you mean a balance sheet? What do you, Imogen, what do you mean there? Do you want to open your mic? What do you mean? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that like, you know, we, how we can look at a bank statement and like analyze the different aspects of it to, um, to put it in our like spreadsheets and- um, What do you mean by a bank statement? Um, like how when what they purchase and what they like bring into the um, bank and like how they have their expenses and like their debits and their credits and how they um how it can change and it all kind of flows together in a way. We haven't looked at a bank statement though. Oh, that is true. <laughs> so I'm getting ahead of myself. The um the bank statement is where our cash going in and out isn't it, into the bank. And uh, we reconcile our bank statements to the cash balances in our own accounts. We can do that very easily with counting, you know, the accounting systems. Now you can do it each day, just in the morning. And you can keep your own accounts live. Um, and a lot of businesses do that now. 
by keeping their cash their, their cash balances in their their own accounts in sync, you know, reconciled with the bank. And uh, yeah, so we haven't really looked at that. So um, we are focusing on the financial statements at the moment. Okay, that's all right. Um, Carolyn, owners are separate to the business. The entity concept, the key concept, quite a lot of people are getting their minds around that. It's a nice, simple concept. And most people find it pretty straightforward because they already think that anyway. But owners are separate to the business and assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. Carolyn, you've got, you've got the fundamental accounting equation. Good to write it in into the um, Socrative uh, comments because it gives you a practice of writing it out. Uh, know that assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities and you've got the business model that underlies accounting. Andrew, the brackets indicate a negative number on the financial statements. That's good. That's a common practice in, in financial statements. The brackets indicate a negative number. And when you're formatting your spreadsheet, the numbers in it, you can choose a format that uses brackets for negative numbers. And Nita, you don't put the brackets in when you enter the numbers. You just enter the numbers. So you put, might put minus 100,000, but it's presentation. Which is where, which is the formatting that you might format it to have brackets. Anita, entity concept is the most essential concept as it has to separate to its owner, even though assets such as equipment are bought from the owner. That's right. The entity concept is fundamental to accounting. So the firm is separate to the owners. That's the same even if it's a sole trader and there's no separate legal entity. And as far as tax is concerned, you've got to, it's all going to come to the owner. But it's counting views as a separate. So the firm might have some assets, such as, you know, might have some equipment, might be a store, might have some stock in the store or some uh, fixtures and fittings. They all are assets of the firm. And uh, even though the owner providing those, you know, provides those assets to the firm. And we saw that an increase in an asset is a debit because the firm owes a debt, if you like. Firm is, owes an obligation to the owners to look after the asset that has been given by the owners and to provide a return on it. Lachlan in Sydney, the accounting equation, assets plus expenses equals, equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. So a little equal sign in there. The accounting equation. So, in, so for Lachlan too, the accounting equation is the most important thing. Sophia in Brisbane, how to not be a broke business. <laughs> Going broke in business is just not fun, you know. How not to not be a broke business and how office chairs can't be a source of payment. Well, seriously, why companies make annual reports? Well, it's not a bad thing to understand about the importance of cash in business. We'll be focusing on profits and so forth and adding value in business, but cash is also important. Um, but seriously, why companies make annual reports? So why do they? Sophia, why do, why do firms have annual reports and make financial statements? What did you mean? You can open up your mic. Sophia, what did you mean? No, oh, keep moving on. Tyler in Rockhampton. How the accounting equation, assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. Do you see how you, Tyler got a little chance to write it in? And uh, the uh, can be understood Ease more easily by being broken down into the balance sheet and income statements. So the information is much clearer. It's an interesting, interesting observation. Yes, so we've got the fundamental accounting equation, assets and expenses and equity and revenue and liability, but we present them as the finan in the financial statements, which is where Tyler's coming from. So the balance sheet is showing the assets, equity and liabilities of a firm at a certain date. And the income statement showing the revenue and expenses over a period. 
So as we get more familiar with our financial statements this term, one of our objectives in the unit is that you'll feel much more comfortable looking at firms' financial statements. They won't be quite so scary. Quite a lot of people can, or a lot of people find them sort of scary and sort of incomprehensible. They've got some funny words, you know. Um, but I'm just introducing you to them and you'll get, get more familiar and you find they're not that scary after all. And so the balance sheet shows the assets, equity and, and liabilities at a certain date. Assets, equity and liabilities are permanent accounts. They just keep going on. The income statement shows revenue and expense accounts. They're temporary accounts. They start at zero every year. And then you, like, various transactions go through. At the end of the year, we take revenue and expense, less expenses and we put them in and we calculate our profit. And that profit is then closed off and, and transferred to equity at the end of the year. And then we start the revenue expenses, we've got zero again, and we do it again next year. And so that's the revenue expenses in the income statement. Also reinforcing that cash is king. Cash is the Elvis Presley of assets. That's right, especially as far as employees are concerned. Yeah, Tyler, you probably have been an R and employee. You, you wanna get paid in cash. Suppliers, everybody wants to get paid in cash. And why do we want to get paid in cash? It's because we can e it's easily exchangeable for other things. I can take my cash into the supermarket and I, I can buy food. I can take my cash into the car dealer and buy a car. I can take my cash, you know, and go on a holiday. <laughs> but I can't take other assets, just they're not like that. It's good, Tyler. There's some good insights. Patrick, the relationship between the financial statements. Patrick, what did you mean by that? Patrick in Brisbane. You want to open up your mic. The relationship between the statements. We haven't really looked at that too much yet, but we will be. Future weeks. I'm going to introduce the financial statements over a few weeks. But we're going to see how the financial statements are interconnected. There's a relationship between the financial statements. I'm just introducing the balance sheet and income statement at the moment, but they are related and interconnected. And that's something that we'll be looking more into. Misty, how do I, in future weeks, how to understand our financial statements better and knowing that some companies only have one of each statement? <laughs> I know what you mean, Misty. Our firms all have a balance sheet. They might call it something else, like a statement of financial position or a number of other names. They have one um, statement of change in equity. They also have one cash flow statement. With income statements, they may have one or two. Brahmin Healthcare has two. So it has an income statement and a statement of comprehensive income. And some people might just have one that's a statement of comprehensive income that includes the income statement as well. When we're putting in the statement of changes in equity, and not statement of changes in equity, the income statement and the statement of comprehensive income, we're putting, like Ryman's has two, if your firm has two, we put them all in, just flow one from the other into our income statement is one thing. SOA, welcome SOA, You're, you've, you've arrived recently. Importance of a balance sheet and income statement for a firm or a company, yeah, so, we're looking at these two critical statements and we see how they cover all the, everything for our firm, all the five elements. Cash is the main assets needed for a business. Yes, see, well, we need it. Well, we need other assets, but cash is important because without cash, we go broke. But all, like Ryman Healthcare has very little cash. You don't have much cash. It has billions of dollars of retirement village units. So you could argue the retirement village village uh, centres and units it has um, much more important to it than cash. But it, it has some serious assets here, billions of dollars. But cash is like the oil that greases everything, keeps everything moving. It's paying all, it's paying all these expenses, a million dollars a day or more. More than two thirds of it is staff expenses. It's paying a lot of salaries. It's paying say $700,000 in cash, in salaries every day 
of the year, including Christmas. It's just coming out. And so, so it's an important asset, but of course there's a lot of other assets that are needed in a business. But cash has its own financial statement because of that. And what questions remain unanswered? Sophia in Brisbane. Nothing for the moment, but I will ask Lois if about it on my Friday workshop lesson. So Sophia's in Brisbane. You're, you're fortunate you've got Lois Kempnich and your Friday class, so you can ask questions. And in those, in those locations where we have classes, there's four locations, you get the chance to, in your tutorial, to uh, you can work through your assignments uh, in that face-to-face -face environment. And you can ask Lois questions. Lois and I have worked together for 10 years and, uh, and she's a very capable and well-regarded practitioner, as well as a very experienced teacher. Anita, how do I do the ratio and restated financial statements on my company spreadsheet? Anita, you don't have to do them yet. <laughs> you know, the spreadsheet has various tabs. We're just putting the, we're just doing the financial statements tab at this moment. In assignment two, that's assignment one, the financial statements tab. Assignment two is the restated financial statements tabs, the ratios and all that stuff. So you don't have to worry about that. That's something to look forward to in the coming weeks. Did I answer that, Anita? Yes, thank you. It's great. <laughs> uh, Patrick didn't comment because he was just getting off the train. Lots of noise. So people are at work, they get moving around. So that's all right. You don't need to connect to the mic. And I should have been keeping closer to the to the chat. Very fine to answer in the chat. Perfectly good. Carolyn, I would like to know how the owners being separate to the business is used by third parties, e.g. governments, to decide if the owners have income from the business. So Carolyn, this is a good question. Carolyn's saying, well, accounting looks at the owner being separate to the business, but what about, that's accounting, but what about outside parties like the government, like regulatory bodies, like the tax authorities. What, how do they figure this out? Well, some businesses are separate legal entities, companies. And the idea of a company being a separate legal entity to its owners came from accounting. Because accounting was considering that, it became a, sort of an idea. And then um, it was thought, well, let's make them legal, legally separate. And, uh, and so companies were formed. But most businesses in Australia are not companies. Most businesses in Australia, the overwhelming majority, 98% of businesses are sole traders or partnerships. Those businesses are not separate legal entities. So if the owner's paying their tax, it's not like the, the business pays tax and they pay tax separately. No, no, no. They, they look at the, the whole, you know, the, the owner is liable for tax. The business isn't liable for tax. It doesn't exist in terms of tax authority. But you've got your separate accounts and from, you've got your accounts for your business and then your own personal accounts or what, however you keep your own personal finances. And um, the authorities will look at both of those. But... Um, we're not going into a whole lot of technical detail. We're not going into tax rules. We're not going into a whole lot of rules about how governments might view um, businesses and how they might regulate them. Or... So, so the key thing is accounting views owners as being separate to the business but that doesn't mean the tax authorities will or the or other regulatory bodies. You might well find that you get quite often you're getting lumped together. But if you've got a sole trader, you will keep your accounts separate. How, um, Sophia, Patrick, the difference between consolidated financial statements and just financial statements. Good question, Patrick. Some firms, some of your firms will show two lots of accounts. 
One lot will be the consolidated financial statements, and they might show separately, perhaps in footnotes or separately within their annual report, financial statements. We're interested in the consolidated financial statements. We're interested in the total group. When they're talking about financial statements or they might talk about company financial statements, they're just talking about the parent company. We're not interested in the parent company. Why is that? We're interested in the group of companies that are controlled by the parent company, that are controlled by the management of the parent company. That's what we're interested in. And uh, some of those subsidiary companies quite often are not 100% owned by the parent, but we put 100% of everything into the consolidated accounts. This is a very important distinction. In, our assignment, in your assignment, when you're entering in the financial statements, enter in the consolidated financial statements. Don't enter in the company or the, you know, the financial statements or the company financial statements. For many of us, they, they're like, that all there is is the consolidated financial statements, like Ryman in healthcare. But for some companies, um, less so in Australia, actually, but overseas, but some companies can show um, the company financial statements, which are the statements of the parent, and we're not interested in those. Some more questions. Why, Derek, why is it essential for two years to be on the balance sheet? That's a good question. When you look at the financial statements of your firm and other people's firms, there'll be a lot of differences, but there'll also be quite a lot of similarities. They're all showing two years of figures, for example, and there are various other similarities. It's a little bit like when with, with people, we're all different, but most people, most people have two eyes and a nose and a mouth. You know, they've got sort of general look, even though there's huge diversity. And financial statements are like that. The reason for that is even I said there are no rules for how they look and presentation and terminology. Well, there are a few rules on how they look, you know. So overall, that's true. But in terms of some specifics, we're just introducing you. But in terms of specifics, there are some rules, just a few rules on presentation and so forth. There's a financial statement. There's a, uh, an accounting standard on it. And one of the presentation requirements is that you show two years of data. The reason for that is so that when you're looking at the, say, the balance sheet, you can look at all the assets and you can compare them with the year before. You can sort of see whether, you know, the cash has gone up or down or the, the property plant equipment's gone up or down and so forth or changed a lot, stayed the same. And more than that, there's a requirement that the, that last, that the, you know, the previous year's figures that you include in this year's balance sheet in a separate column, they have to be prepared on the same basis as the ones you did this year. And that's fine for most items because you haven't changed your accounting treatments for most things, but you might've changed your accounting treatment for you know, some, a few items, one or two items. And, um, and that's because accounting standards change, some of the rules change. You heard a little bit about from our guest speaker last week, Marnie from Evans Edwards, Marnie McGrath, that um, they had a whole heap of changes around. We, were, we all had a lot of changes in COVID, for example. Sometimes you get a whole lot, other times not so many. But if there's a change in our, and also there are choices, we can choose between different accounting treatments on how we do certain things like depreciation or accounting for inventory. And uh, so we might change what, how we want to do it. And for either of those reasons, we might have a different treatment this year. If we do, we have to restate the previous year's figures for those items based on the accounting treatments of this year, even though last year we might have done it a bit differently. The reason for that is so that we can compare apples with apples when we're looking at this year's with last year's in, say, the balance sheet or income statement. And this is why some people, a number of people will start to notice this. That is why when you're looking at, say, your 2021 accounts has the 2020 figures in it as a second column. When you look at the 20, and that's in your 21 annual report, but when you look at the 2020 annual report and look at the 2020 figures, they may be slightly different um, for some items. Um, compared to the 2020 figures in the 2021 annual report. That's for two main reasons. One is that 
Um, the accounting treatments might have changed in 2021 and you've restated the 2021s. The other thing is balance date adjustments. When a firm completes its accounts and publishes them, um, it might find some errors. It's always finding, always find a few errors in the accounts. You can find them years later or you can find them sometime up the balance date. And when, if you found some errors as, you, as um, they come up, then you'll adjust your accounts and tidy up. They're usually just small things, you know. And so sometimes some of the figures might just change by a very small amount, and that's can be because they've tidied up a few um, errors in the data entry or other errors in the accounts that, that, that have come to light later. Um, so why is it essential for two years to be on the balance sheet? Well, there are some requirements. That's a requirement in the accounting standards that you show two years. So there's a few little requirements on presentation. Ashley Brisbane, I understood everything. Oh, Ashley, you are so brilliant. I wish I understood everything. But what you're saying is that you, you're getting a good introduction and you're connecting with some of these concepts. What does deferred tax mean? Why do companies have restated statements? How do you view financial statements if there are no footnotes? Hester has a lot of questions. I've noticed that, Hester. So here's a few good questions. Deferred tax. Now, we know about accrual accounting. I've just introduced the concept to you, and people are still getting their minds around it. But there's a lot of complexity around a lot of accounting treatments. We're not getting into a whole lot of technical detail in this unit, it's introductory. But when you've got your income tax expense in your income statement, a lot of people think that's the cash. It, they, people think everything's cash. So for income tax, you think that's the cash you paid in income tax that year for the company, you know, the company pays income tax. Well, no, it's not. We have accrual accounting. It's not the cash. <laughs> It's the economic substance of the income tax. So, for example, you know, we pay tax. Companies pay tax in arrears a little bit. You might often companies, larger companies can pay every month in arrears. We might pay every six months or quarterly or even annually. But say you were doing it um, quarterly, when you get to the end of the year, you haven't paid your last quarter's tax. You haven't paid the cash. But you'll put the full year's tax in, for example. So you'll have this... This um, it's a it's it's not deferred tax, but it's a current. Um, you'll find that you've got a current tax that you've got to still pay that, that uh, you haven't paid the cash yet. Now deferred tax means um, that the the what we did this year, the transactions, the activities we did this year, um, will result in the company having to pay some tax. But not all of that tax has to be paid this year. And it's not just that a little bit has still to be paid in the next few months, but we might not have to pay the tax for a few years, but it will be related to some economic substance, the economic substance of what we did today. So even though we haven't paid the cash, this, the tax in cash this year, because of certain things we did, we know that we're gonna to have to pay tax in say, two years or three years or five years or 10 years. And so we put all the tax in this year, all the tax, even the tax that we don't have to pay cash for. And so that creates this deferred tax, which means that we've got this benefit in the future because in terms of our accounts, we haven't paid, we, we have deferred paying of that cash, but we're of the cash for the tax, but we're putting the deferred tax expense right in our accounts now. So in the future, when we do have to pay the tax in our accounts, we'll be able to draw down the deferred tax assets so that um, to cover that, because we've already put it in as an expense in our accounts. Anyway, don't want to get too much into the details of accrual accounting, but deferred tax is related to the idea of accrual accounting and how the all the items in our Income statement and balance sheet are not necessarily income statement are not cash necessarily. They may be if it happens to be that way, and tax tax expense is not cash paid to the government. Why do it's the economic substance of our tax liabilities? Why do companies have restated statements? 
Well, the reason that's in the second year. So you've got this year's accounts, 2021, you've got last year's accounts, 2020. They can often be restated if the accounting standards have changed between 2020, 21, for example. And we restate the 2020 annual statements in the 2021 annual financial statements to make them consistent. So we want the 2020 figures to be consistent with how we've calculated the 2021 figures. So the reason we restate the 2020 figures sometimes is because we are, we've got some different accounting treatments in 2021 to what we did the previous year. And so we want to compare apples with apples. How do you view financial statements if there are no footnotes? Well, if there are no footnotes, you can only look at the numbers that are there. So you see, not all items have footnotes. Some items don't have footnotes. So if there are no footnotes for that item, you have no more information about it. That's it. But if there's a footnote, you can find out a bit more. Crystal, how to access online quiz. Now, the assessment tab, this is how we access all the assessments. And that's how, that's how you submit everything. And to access the quiz, you click on here. So it's the, to go to Moodle, the assessment tab, click on, click on the quiz. And if I turn myself into a student, you'll see what it looks like. So you go to assessment, quiz, and here it says, and then you attempt the quiz now and you click on that. Does that answer the question? Hello. Hello. Hello, who's this? Uh, this is Sabrina. So uh, <clears throat> I'm an international student. Uh, in When I was offshore, that time I didn't join any online class or anything. Actually, this is my first class. So my question, uh, my question is that, did I miss any quiz or any important uh, thing which is count, which count my uh, number credit or something? So uh, what to do next? And that's all. That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, and so the, um, the question is, um, it's week three, I'm coming in week three, have I missed some of the assessment? And if I have, is that going to, disadvantage me in terms of the grades and marks? The answer to the first one is yes, we have submitted um, the step one assignment one, and that was submitted in Monday week two, and the quiz is open this week, and so it's happening now. To find out, and I'll answer the second question in a minute, to, add, to find all the assessments, everything about the assessment is in the assessment tile on Moodle. So you go to, um, that's how you submit, but to get into, to find out everything about the assessments, it's all in one place, the assessment tile here. So there's the assessment overview. We have three assessments. One is assignment one, 25%. One is a quiz, 5%. One is assignment two, 70%. And we talk week five, week three in that. And to find the actual dates, you click on that and that'll get you to the academic calendar and you can see which days it is. There's the company spreadsheet that you'll be using in assignment one and two, and that's how you find your company. If you're not in there because you were enrolled a bit late, you email me and I'll give you one. There's some exemplars so you can see some past students' work to give you an idea on how we do all the assignments. And then here's the detail. Click on that, that tells you about the assignment one. A little video on how to set up your spreadsheet for your company, here's the quiz, and there's the quiz instructions. And you can get into the quiz this way as well. You can get it in up here, or you can get into it there. But there's the quiz instructions, so that'll tell you everything. And here's assignment two. You don't have to worry about assignment two yet, but it's, it's assignment one, assignment two. So that's all the assessments, and you are a bit behind. So you, you need to get started on assignment one, and that'll tell you everything. You do step one first, you submit step one up here, you see, and then you submit the rest. Now, late penalties for assignment one, step one, and any steps in assignment one are calculated based on the due date for all of assignment one, which is Monday week five. So if you submit assignment step one today or any time before Monday week five, you'll have no late penalties. 
So you won't be penalised for submitting your step one late. We understand that people might come late or particularly this year, but on all sorts of reasons. So you're not penalised. And the other is the quiz. The quiz is open this week and you see it's due on Saturday this week, 10 o'clock, week three. But it's also open, it's kept open. So if we look at this quiz here, it opened on Saturday, 19th of March last week, and it closes. It's due. We want you to complete it by 10 o'clock this Saturday, but we keep the quiz open until week 11, Friday, week 11, the 27th of May. So if you haven't completed it, you can still complete it um, prior to that time. So again, if you don't quite get the quiz finished before the end of this week because you've just enrolled or come late, you can still do it and you won't be penalised. So no late penalties. You won't get penalised for, for doing the quiz a little bit late, but I strongly encourage you to do the quiz now because it relates to chapters one and two of the study guide and just helps you review a couple of those concepts. The quiz is an open book quiz, so you you need it's in the it's in the quiz um, uh, the quiz guidelines the, the quiz. Uh, see the, the quiz instructions, which is there. If you open that, it comes up into there. Um, you, should, you should have access to the study guide chapters one and two. So you should bring that with you either online or if you've printed it out. And it's an open book, so you can refer to the study guide. The idea is that you can refer to the study guide. So if you get asked a question and um, you, if you want to check it, you can go back in the study guide. Check. We give you some guidance as to where from the study guide it is. So the idea is just to review a few concepts early on because you need the repetition. If you're going to get, for example, the fundamental accounting equation going, good to have a few repetitions or whatever the key concepts are. Did that answer that a little bit? Now, there's some questions in, in the... Um, in the chat, from where do I get this material? Is this an ebook? Now, the study guide. The study guide, go to the unit introduction. Um, this question is from Sabrina. You go to the unit introduction, there's all sorts of things in here, but here is the study guide. All the study guide is here the study guide chapters and the study guide podcasts and there's the links there too. So you can read the study guide. So here are the chapters and there's introduction, chapter one, chapter two, and so on. And uh, you can also listen to it on podcast by the unit introduction. And if you go to the study guide podcasts, they're two, they're half hour podcasts. So introduction, that's half, sections, I.1 and I.2, the first half of the introduction, there's the second half, first part of the half of chapter one, the second half. So you can click on that and then you can listen to it and you can also read it because the uh, video, I have ads in YouTube now, but we get that. And you can see here, you can read it while listening to it. So if you want to, or you can just listen. So that's where the study guide is. And um, there's the weekly schedule there that shows you what the reading is. But then each week, each week we have the study guides that are relevant to that week. So the introduction in chapter one is here. See, so you can click on that and click on that. It'll get you to them. So there's the introduction. And you can click on that and there it is. And so let's say for chapter one, and each week we have that as well. So you can access the study guide here and you can exercise it all, access it all there. I think, did that answer your question, Sabrina? Yeah, uh, yes, and now I get it. That's all good, it's all good. That's okay. uh, my another question was, where will I find the recorded classes? Could you say that again? Sorry? Oh, what was that again? I missed it. Sorry. Okay. I am, I asked why will I get the recorded classes? I know it's more model, but uh, specifically oh, yeah. the, the place. Yeah, the, the videos of the classes. So 
say for week one, why don't we do, yeah, we'll do week one. Um, oh, you okay. see how we've got the video for lecture week one? So if you go to the week one, yes, I can. The overview, the learning material, there's the study mm -hmm. guides, then there's mm -hmm. the video. So if you click on that, you'll get the video for week one. Oh, thank you. Oh, I got it. And then you'll also, oh, I've lost it. Go back to week one. And then you've got the video for the tutorial there as well. Okay, okay. We also had a live stream. We've only had one live stream so far, but we had a live stream week one. But then if you go to week two, you find the same thing. Video lecture week two, video lecture week two, tutorial. And then week three, you go to week three and you find the same thing. Video lecture week three, video. But we're week three. We're doing the video right now. We haven't got the, that. What I've got is I've got last year's videos for the lecture and tutorials are on every week. So if you want to get ahead, you can go to the right up to week 12. And some people like to do that, get ahead. And then what I do by Friday, 5 p.m. each week, I replace. So by 5 p.m. this week, I'll replace the video lecture week three from last year with this week, this year's video. And the same for the tutorial. And then we're in term one this time, but those videos will last term two and term three for this year. So they're the recorded ones. So that's how we handle the videos. So that helps a little bit? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So good luck. You're catching up a little bit. That's excellent. Yes. Thank you. Not a problem. Young, young, young he, you're you're in South Korea. How can I submit or upload my assessment one steps three to six? Is not in Moodle or Block. Young he. So to how do I submit my assignment one step three to six? You go to this tab here and you click here. And then you add submission here. So that's how you submit your assignment one, steps three to six up here. You find out about all the assessments in the assessment tile. That's where you find out about them and you submit everything up here. And you see all the different ones. Did that answer that young he or did you want to ask another question? Thank you very much, Professor. Is that right? And you're yeah, in South you. Korea? Are you in South Korea at the moment, Young He? Okay, yes, I am. <laughs> On fresh it's still up. It's still up. You're, still up. <laughs> you're, very, you're very clear. You're getting, we're very clear. I hope I'm as clear to you as you are to me. That's very clear. It's like you're in the same room. <laughs> but there you go. All righty. And then Bibek has asked, where can we get a guidance about how to do the assignment? Now, if you are on one of our, we've got four locations where we have live, where we have face-to-face -face classes, which you can attend. Um, they're in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and in uh, Geraldton, West Australia. That's what we're offering this time. So if you're in one of those areas, and particularly if you're an international student, uh, you can go to those classes. International students are required to go to face-to-face -face classes. It's a government requirement of your visa and everything. But um, for, for domestic students, you can choose whether you go to face-to-face -to -face classes or not. But if you're in those areas, you can go to those classes whenever you like. Um, you can be enrolled online. It doesn't matter how you're enrolled. You can go to those classes in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Geraldton as you like. And the timetable, if you go to the timetable, handbook in the timetable, they will tell you um, when those classes are up. And, um, but if you are not going to any, um, if you're not in those areas, you're not going to face-to-face -face class, then um, we have the lecture, but the lecture is for content. We're sort of discussing some questions at the end, which is fine. But in the tutorials, that's where you can get all the help on your assessments and assignments. We're doing a little bit of it here, sort of at the end of the lecture, 
But in the tutorials, you can take your questions, you can ask anything you like, you can share your spreadsheets and other work, and you can discuss. And it's just like the face-to-face -face classes on those four locations online. You can attend the tutorials, and that's primarily they're there to support you to do those assessed learning tasks. The assessments in this unit are the learning tasks. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Bye for now.